Welcome back. In the last video we talked about how different vertebrates had very similar forelimbs. So for example how reptiles, um, frogs, so that's amphibians, mammals or fish, how they all have forelimbs which are quite similar. So that was a second hand investigation. Now we're going to cover the next second hand investigation. And this one says students will use available evidence to analyze using a named example how advances in technology have changed scientific thinking about evolutionary relationships. So what that means is we have to um, look at how technology, so for example different machines, different procedures, how they have helped us to understand evolution better. <clears throat> Plus, also important, we have to give a named example. So we have to name one of the technologies and kind of be able to explain it as well to a degree. Um, so if you remember, or if you haven't watched it, that's okay, but we went over the evidence of evolution in one of the previous videos, and one of them was that we have very similar biochemistry. So the study of biochemistry was just looking at molecules and chemicals in our body and how they were all quite similar. So, but um, yeah, biochemistry refers to studying, or the biochemistry of our body refers to studying the chemicals and molecules found in our body. And using this biochemistry, we, use, we could compare the DNA, compare enzyme structures, compare hemoglobin structures and other things of our body itself to other animals. So we could compare these molecules with our molecules with those molecules of different animals and allowed us to see how similar they were. Right? So, um, so what I'm going to cover is I'm going to cover a few technologies which allowed us to understand the similarities between our DNA and similarities between our enzyme structures and hemoglobin better. So named examples are going to come up next, so right here. So first we've got something called DNA hybridization. And hybridization, hybrid refers to sort of two things joining together. Um, so in this case, the example, we actually we have a DNA molecule here of a human. So this is the human DNA. And then we have the, the DNA molecule of a chimp. And if you've ever seen the structure of a DNA, that's kind of like it's wound up in this wound up shape here. And what we're going to do is first we're going to unzip it and we're going to get half the strand. So we're going to kind of cut it in half, have a top and a bottom strand. And what we're going to use is we're going to use the top strand of the human DNA, actually the bottom strand of the human DNA and the top strand of the chimp DNA. And we're going to hybridize them. So we're going to join them together. Right, so this was this is the hybridization part here, the hybridization part, hybridization part. So we've joined the human DNA to the chimp DNA, and the reason why we're doing that is because we want to see how similar they are. Right, we're going to see how similar they are, and the way we can do that. So this was again a procedure. First, we separate the strands, and then we recombine them. So we hybridize them. We recombine. In this example, the human DNA with the chimp DNA. So this is here, you can imagine this being the human DNA and this being the chimp DNA before it was on, um, split into two. And what should always happen, if you haven't done too much about genetics, don't worry, this is just for, you, just for this explanation, but it will cover more about genetics very soon. But um, usually you have a guanine, which is that G, which always binds to um, cytosine, which in this case is that pink. And um, we have adenine always binding to thiamine. Right? So if everything's normal, we should have always have G binding with C and A binding with T. So at the moment, before they were um, cut into two, we have that happening here. If you were to look at these, you would see they're all binding as they should. A's with T's and G's with C's. Same for the chimp DNA as well. We have A's binding with T's and C binding with G's. Now what we do is we cut them apart. Now here, that's this part is a chimp. The lower part is a chimp DNA, and the top part is a human DNA. So what we're looking now is which of these have actually joined together correctly. Any joining together correctly means there's similarities in our DNA. If they don't join correctly, that means it's not similar. So if we go for each, we have a red binding yellow, so A with T, that's correct. Next one is like another yeah, red with yellow, that's good. Next, we have green with uh, purple, which is the way it should be as well. Another green with purple, so that's good. Now we have a yellow with T, correct. 
Now we have a yellow with purple. So this one is not correct, right? So yellow should be binding with red and green with purple. So this is a yellow with purple. So here is a, a non-similarity. These two parts are not similar. And then if we call, go on, we've got red binding with yellow, correct. Red binding with yellow, correct. Green binding with orange. <laughs> Sorry. Green binding with pink. I had a moment of brain freeze. Um, red binding with yellow. And then this one is green binding with red. So green should bind with purple. Green should not bind with red. So we've got another not similarity here. So if you look at this, we have maybe 12, 13 similarities and two differences. So overall, if you compare the DNA, you can see, okay, there's actually quite a few similarities between the human DNA and the chimp DNA. And this is only supposed to be a simplification, but if, if this were done in, in actual reality, you'd find that 98% of our DNA is the same in humans as is in chimps. So 98% thats a big, big number. And so we can use that DNA hybridization, this technology here, to allow us to compare DNA. So that was one of the evidences for evolution, to allow us to compare DNA better. And yeah, this was kind of the procedure to do it. And what we're doing is we're looking at how similar these bases are. These were all bases, looking how similar they were. If they were similar, that means we're more closely related. If they were very different, that means we're further further apart in terms of relationships. So even most, even like a bacteria still has, I think 50 or 60% shared um, genetics. But the chimp is our closest one, so this is our closest one. And he has 98% shared DNA. So then we have another technology called the amino acid sequencing. If you guys remember, proteins, which are the building blocks of our body, they are made up of amino acids. So you have a long chain of amino acids, and that's a protein. So what you have here is you can imagine you have one of these balls is an amino acid. And if you have thousands of them, so I've written here, proteins can be made up of thousands of amino acids. You have thousands of them in a row. That's called a protein, right? And also important is that there are 20 different types. So 20 different types of amino acids. So you can imagine each of these colors is a different amino acid, right? So we have a a red, a blue, a green, a yellow, a blue, a purple, a orange. Each of these could be a different type of amino acid. There's a total of 20 different types. So proteins are made up of thousands of amino acids and a total of 20 different types of amino acids as well. So if we look at, for example, if we compare hemoglobin, which is hemoglobin is a protein, right? Compare that from a P, maybe P for pig, and compare that to that of a horse, so plus H for horse. So what we're doing is we're comparing the structure of that hemoglobin and seeing if these colors are matching up correctly. If it's sequence, so amino acid sequencing, sequencing refers to kind of the order they come in. So the order they come in. So we're looking at the order they come in. And what we find is with quite a few, especially mammals, are have very similar structures in terms of their um, proteins. So there's very sim much similarity in terms of the order of the amino acids. Whereas for some other molecules, some other ones, it's a bit further apart. There's more differences. And the more differences there are in this structure, the further there are in terms of our ancestry. So mammals are, all have a very similar structure in terms of their proteins. But maybe if you compare that to fish, that's a bit further away already. Compare that to the proteins of insects, that's even further away. So that's, again, another way we, we can establish how far something is away from us in terms of relationships. Um, then we have something called another technology. It's called the radioisotope dating. And that was the use of radioisotopes to date stuff, so to find out how old it is. Right? So what we do is we use two things. We use them to measure the age of rocks, and we use them to measure the age of fossils. So why would we know, want to know the age of the rocks? Well, if you imagine there's lots of rocks around us, and that kind of allows us to get a grasp on how old, how old Earth is, so planet Earth itself. And if it's actually long enough for evolution to have taken part place, because evolution takes a long time. So is it old enough for evolution to take place? And for that radioisotope dating, which is a technology, we found out that it's probably roughly 4.6 billion years old. So that's one, one root use of radioisotope dating to, to date rocks, to find out how old things are. And also, we want, to, we want to be able to date fossils to find out how old 
a different um so when how old different animals are like how all the bones of different animals are and through that we found out for example that the dinosaurs and uh, the bones of dinosaurs are older than the bones of tigers much older which kind of tells us that the bone that the dinosaurs lived before the tigers which makes sense because they probably lived many millions of years ago, hundred millions of years ago. Um, so yeah, the, the fossils was used. Fossil dating was used to find out how old things were, especially bones. Rocks are measured to find out how old rocks are, and some, for example, how old the Earth itself is. All right, so I quickly summarize. We've got DNA hybridization, and that was um, de hybridization means joining two things together. So we join two different sets of DNA together from two different species or two different animals. And using that, we can find out how closely related, how closely our DNA is matched, how many similarities there are. And yeah, for example, the chimpanzee has 98% similar DNA compared to humans. So that's quite quite close. We have the amino acid sequencing, where we have we look at which order these amino acids come in our proteins, because the proteins are made up of amino acids. And the more we have, the more similarities we have, the closer we are related as well. So that's another another technology here, amino acid sequencing. And we had radioisotope dating, which was to allow us to figure out how old things are, such as rocks and fossils. And we needed, we needed that technology to be able to figure out if we're quite, um, if the Earth is old enough and when living things actually existed, when they were around. If we only have a fossil, we don't know how old it is. It's not that much use. So yeah, know what technologies, how they helped us understand how the relationships of evolution, so how evolution happened. And you need to be able to use, remember at least one of these examples or any other examples that you might find more interesting. But at least one example and see how overall how technology helped us to understand evolution better as well. So I hope that helped.